G'day everyone, welcome to Life in the Peloton, I'm Mitch Stocker and I've got a special episode for you this week, this is the Vuelta episode. The Vuelta España, my favourite Grand Tour, actually arguably my second favourite race, of course after Paris-Roubaix. I've recently gone back and had a look at my stats, I don't know why I was doing that but you know how you go on the internet and I found out that I rode Paris-Roubaix 11 times. That was the race that I raced the most in throughout my career. I'm happy about that because I love that race. I actually raced the Vuelta Espana seven times as well. So up there, I couldn't believe it. I was like seven times, that's a lot, but I enjoyed it. It's on at the moment and what I want to do was take you behind the scenes, a little bit about the Vuelta, but also a little bit about Grand Tours. Now I've got a cool little crew for you to speak to. I spoke with Neo Pro Luke Plapp. He's from Ineos Grenadiers, 21 years old. He's Australian champ. He hails from the Brunswick Cycling Club, my club here in Melbourne. And I want to hear his opinion about it. I want to hear what it's like for a Neo. What does it feel like to do a Grand Tour? I've actually forgotten what it feels like way back to do my first Grand Tour. And I want to feel what it's like because you build it up. He's in the third week. Is he anxious? Is he tired? I know he's tired, but what's he feeling? So it was really good to chat to him. I spoke also with Daryl Limpy on the other end of the spectrum. He's with Israel Premier Tech. He's 37 years old, 15th year as a professional. He's a South African, a good friend of mine from when I raced in the peloton. It was good to hear his view on it all. Back in the Grand Tours, what's it? Because he's an old pro. He's probably not going to be as excited, of course, as Luke Plapp. I spoke to, yes, of course, our favorite, Luke Durbridge, 31 years old. He's in his 11th year as a pro. He's done 13 Grand Tours. He's on Bike Exchange, Jayco. It was good to hear his view on the Vuelta. His first time doing the Vuelta, he's ridden the Tour de France and the Giro numerous times, but his first time in the Vuelta. And I was like, mate, welcome. This is a tough one. What do you think? So we hear what he has to say. But then I spoke to Fred Wright. He's on Bahrain Victorious, 23 years old, third year as a pro. He's in his fourth Grand Tour, second time he's done the Vuelta. But if you haven't seen already, he is on absolute fire this season. Well, the second half of this season. He had an amazing Tour de France, very close to winning a stage there. He went to the Commonwealth Games, second in the time trial there, almost won the road race as well, fifth there came into the Vuelta, he's got five top tens in this year's Vuelta alone. He still hasn't got that win, but he's in astonishing form. And again, he has a different opinion on the Grand Tour as the rest do. So a little bit about the Vuelta España. The Vuelta is a part of the three Grand Tours. In the season, you've got the three Grandies, as we call them. You've got the Tour de France, of course, as you know it, in July. Before that, you've got the Giro d'Italia. And at the end of the year, we've got the Vuelta España. The lap around Spain. Originally, we had the Tour de France first, then the Giro appeared, and then in spite of the success of the Tour de France and the Giro, the first edition of the Vuelta a Spain was back in 1935. It was originally in spring then, in the late April, but in 1995, they moved it to September. It's often seen as the ideal preparation for the World Championships, which is just about to happen in October, actually, ironically, out here in Australia, up in Wollongong. The funny thing with the Vuelta is you get a jack-of-all-trades riders there. You've got guys scratching for contracts. You've got guys who have missed out in the Tour de France and want to do something in the Vuelta. And then you've got guys preparing for the World Championship. So it's a really weird dynamic. But the racing is ferocious. It doesn't have the hype of the Tour de France. It doesn't have the mystique of the Giro. But it's got the tough racing and the passionate fans up in the Basque country, and it's got the good weather. I love the heat, so I certainly love the Vuelta a España, and I was based for a lot of my career in Spain or in Andorra as well, so I loved racing like I was feeling at home. That's what I loved about the race. I didn't love the steep climbs, and we're going to hear about that from the riders too. The podcast this year is being brought to you by Rafa. They've been great to help me produce the podcast this year, putting a lot of passion into life in the pelt, and I'm loving working with them. One thing I'm loving too is that I don't have to get caught up in the lycra all the time. I'm doing a lot of different cycling now. I'm out on the gravel. I'm on the road sometimes. I'm actually dipping my toe into mountain biking. And when I dip out there for an hour or two, 
I don't bother lycraing up anymore. I throw on the trail wear from Rafa. This is like stuff you can walk into a cafe in and people don't turn their heads, but you can actually ride in it. It's pants, it's a loose fitting long sleeve, and it's awesome. I hit the trails and it's comfortable, it's easy to ride in, and plus, like I said, you can walk into a shop and don't feel self-conscious about wearing lycra well i don't really feel self-conscious about wearing lycra anymore how could i i've been wearing lycra for so many years but you know what i mean it's awesome it's something that i'm really not used to and i'm actually really enjoying it i wear the trail pants around anyway because they're really cool pants to wear they fit my weird cycling shaped legs pretty well as well that's a hard thing to get right when you're a cyclist is pants that fit And I'm loving this trail wear. I love it when I go out mountain biking, but I also love wearing it around too. Guys, sit back and listen to this one because the Vuelta Espana is now. It's in the last week. So the guys you're hearing from now are in the race. I spoke to them on the rest day. A really special thing to do because that is a sacred day, the last day before they hit this last week. A lot of tired guys. So I was really appreciated hearing from them all. I hope you enjoy this episode. Here we are. Luke Platt, Daryl Impey, Luke Durbridge, and of course, Fred Wright. All right, well, we're talking with Luke Plapp. Now, Ineos Grenadiers, 21-year-old, first-year pro, Aussie champ, but most importantly, Brunswick Cycling Club member. I'm a Brunswick member, the best club in the world. Plappy, mate, welcome to the pod. I've been wanting to have you on here for a while, and I'm also going to get you back on here. This is just a little sneak peek for everyone listening out there. Nah, good to be here, mate. It's, uh, yeah, no, I, I even wanted to be on the pod, but yeah, look, I'm <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting back to those Thursday night at Brunswick's as well, and when I'm back home next week, and uh, yeah, doing some motor pacing too, mate. Well, if anyone out there doesn't know what we're talking about, you should know what Brunswick Cycling Club is, and if anyone out there doesn't know Luke Plapp, I don't know where you've been, but you're going to see, you're going to hear a lot about him coming up because he's the new machine coming through the Peloton. But what I want to talk to him about now is this is his first Grand Tour and what a Grand Tour to start with. My favorite Grandy, the Vuelta, but under underestimated, underrated Grand Tour. It's a tough one, isn't it, Plappy? Well, mate, everything I've always been told is, ah, it's the perfect one to start. It's, uh, it's the easiest. Yeah. Just work in nicely, mate. I am on my absolute hands and knees at the moment. Um, it is as savage as I could have imagined. Can you give me one short sentence to describe your feelings, sensations, your emotions of this year's for Welter, like your own personal feelings so far? Oh, mate, after that first week, I was a shell of a human on my hands and knees and Madrid was that far away, it didn't seem possible. What about, <laughs> what about the sensations of the peloton? Now, what's the feeling of the, the actual peloton? What's, is it tension? You know, what, what, are, what are you feeling about the whole peloton at the moment? It's pretty good, to be honest, mate. It was uh, interesting in that first week watching a few people drop like flies with COVID. Uh, but it seems to be uh, pretty nice now. And what, well, yesterday up uh, Sierra Nevada, we had 90 man group pedal almost, which was, uh, so that was kind of nice. We we're all just there together to, to make sure we got through the Queen stage. But no, I think it settled down. And look, uh, everyone knows the level that some of these guys are at. And it's almost, uh, I guess, unheard of a bit. So we're just, we're just there racing our own race while they uh, have a different one. Mate, you're starting to sound like an old pro. You wouldn't think it was your first Grand Tour. <laughs> What about the start? Because actually you're known for your time trial ability and it started with the triple T. The team finished second. Were you feeling a lot of pressure as you rolled down that start ramp? Not only because you're starting your first Grand Tour, the build up, the hype, but also your role in a triple T. Like, were you feeling, oh, shivers, you know, like this is actually a big day for me. Yes and no, mate. It was uh, it was probably the best way I could have ever started my first Grandy just because it, uh, it just felt so natural to me doing a, a team time trial. But also I... Uh, I knew I wasn't out of my depth, I guess, in that sort of event. And comparing that to the Olympic teams for shoot or something, when you're on the start line of a triple to hits, uh, it's pretty relaxed. So, yeah, there was definitely uh, some pressure to do my role. And I think that was part of the reason I, I got chose for, for this race. 
I knew exactly what to expect and I knew that I, I could deliver it compared to, I guess, not knowing what the level was or what the depth was. I, the first stage I knew was right up my alley, which was, it was a nice way to get introduced to it, to be honest. Oh my gosh. I've never really uh, got to experience that myself in the Triple T. Felt relaxed, you know, just sort of pretty calm, rolling off. I was always, <laughs> excuse the language, shitting myself because it was like, all right, here we go. How long can I hang on for here? Because of guys like you <laughs> just here is ripping my legs off. But how's it actually been? I know it's a big big question the first grand tour what was your expectations before starting before starting it because i know i built it up to something huge and you're building it what's it going to be like i don't know what it's going to be unknown territory now you're in the third week this is probably when it starts to become unknown for you i guess the the hard part was before for this year, my longest uh, race was the Northern Combine three-day tour. No, it wasn't. Um, it then, was not. Yeah, <laughs> it was. So the three-day tour was the longest <laughs> race I've ever done. And then That's Romandy, sh- <laughs> yeah. Romandy beat that this week, uh, or a couple couple weeks ago, sorry, which was seven days. So uh, I was well entering the un- uncharted territory. Uh, oh my gosh. And I think it's just the backing up each day, mate, and the fatigue. That's what I, I had no clue what to expect, but that's what's been the hardest. I just fade every single day compared to some of these guys who are, who are used to it and got the miles in the legs, or even uh, here with Dylan Van Baal and the team, mate. He's doing two and a half, three hours with efforts on rest days. And I'm just like, mate, I don't even know how you, like, I can't, I don't even want to get on my bike, let alone do an extra hour and a half to everyone else. <laughs> it's, it's incredible, isn't it? You just sometimes sing in yourself. I was talking to Dervo about this. You sometimes sing in yourself, who is actually on the front of the peloton at the moment? Like, how could someone possibly be riding in the wind right now? Yes. No, that is exactly what I'm feeling, mate. I don't know how people are putting out these power because I'm holding on for dear life. <laughs> What's it like in the group Etto? You spoke about that before, something that gets spoken about a lot. Now you're going to get experiencing a real group Etto because that's what happens on Grand Tours. It's a bit of a, well, it's supposed to be a bit of a safety blanket, but you do find a lot of guys back there and you do get to relate to a lot of different guys from different teammates because you're all in that basket. You're all feeling the pain and you want to talk to someone about it. Has that what it's been like chatting with the other Aussies or other people from different teams? Yeah. yeah, well, first of all, I thought the group pedal was easy, but mm. it's you mentally switch off and then it's the uncomfortable zone three pace that you're really not mentally prepared for and it feels super hard. But no, nah, it has been nice lately, mate. We've got, uh, oh, I've just been chilling with all the Aussies and the whole Bike Exchange team get around Cadence. So it's uh, it's been nice almost to link back up with my team's pursuit boys and, <laughs> and just talk some smack in the group pedal and, and get through it. Like we had two and a bit hours together uh, up Sierra Nevada. So it was very nice. Have you focused on the finish of, like you you did mention it already, Madrid at the start of the race, and that's the last thing you want to start thinking about at the beginning because you're already feeling pain by about stage three or four, and you're thinking, oh, how am I ever going to make this? Are you thinking about the end right now? Yeah, as soon as I got to the top of Sierra, mate, you couldn't quite see Madrid, but it was just on the horizon (laughs) in the distance. So uh, that was, Sierra was my goal, tip that off and then get through today's rest day and it's it's there it's not there yet but i can i can almost see it <laughs> oh beautiful mate well it is i love this tour because it is once you get through this you're almost at the end of the season and that is a nice feeling to get through this and you know you can completely put yourself in the in the red because you know the season's practically done i've got one question here that's been thrown in from chris rides mtb he said for domestiques how do you know when to finish your turn and drop back so I guess he's referring to, you know, how do you know when your time is done and, and don't go over your limit and still save enough in the bank to get back in the peloton, but also do your turn properly for your teammate? Where's It's a fine line, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's uh, uh, And for me, unfortunately, I haven't had the climbing legs on, so I haven't been able to offer them much at the climbs, but it's basically get them into that 3K barrier. That's been that's been my role uh, on all the flat days and, and the days where the three-kilometer rule is on. It's, uh, yeah. My role is to get Carlos and the boys uh, under that banner and then I can sort of switch it off after that. So it's it's nice. I've got a little finish line to get to. Well, Luke, thanks very much for being on the pod. I Like I said at the start, we're going to get him on for a full length next year, but it's good to have your voice on the podcast. Shout out to the Brunswick Cycling Club too. Beautiful. Thanks, mate. Cheers. All right, Daryl Limpy, here we are. We're at the Vuelta Espana, my old favorite race. And you're at the second rest day, the last rest day. You've got the last week ahead of you. You're in your 11th Grand Tour, 15 years as a pro. 
You're the ripe old age of 37, mate. How does it feel? How's it been over there? How's the old Vuelta going, buddy? Oh, I'll tell you, I've had a hard Vuelta. It hasn't been easy, man. It's, uh, <laughs> especially with the, the, the race has been flat out. The starts have been nuts. The battle for the points is there. The, all that nonsense in the background. And then we've still got like the heat has been, it's, it's been unbearable here, actually. Like, I love the heat, but I'm actually like, wouldn't mind getting into some colder situations. But yeah, the pace has been on. The guys are, I, it almost feels like a different sport to when I like when I started my grand to a career. You kind of you can say that like it's just different. Like there we used to let a break go, and but yeah, it's like every day is an opportunity, and like there's so many guys that ha- won something out of this race. You know, can you give me in a short sentence to describe your feelings, your sensations, your emotions from this year's Vuelta? One short sentence. I, I guess I'm just saying on the limit, on the limit, mate. <laughs> what a- in, ve- in 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 many in many ways. Mentally, physically tired, I'm everything. What about if you could do one short sentence to describe the Peloton's feelings and emotions from this Vuelta? Zero patience with anyone. Really? Oh, man. There's just like people are shouting. Yesterday, I saw teammates just shouting at each other because the one guy was like saying, like, <laughs> it was a nuts time. And they're, they're going, where were you? Where were you? You didn't cover the break. And the guy's like, I just came straight out the arse. And he's like, I'm just aiming at the back. I was just like, oh, man, people are fighting. It's, it's the end of the season, nearly. Oh, people are done. So the tension's building high within teammates. Obviously, the tension builds high between riders in different teams. But when you get back in the bus, what's the vibe like in your team when you get back in there? Because You've got a few older guys in your team. Are you guys just looking around going, what's going on out here, guys? We were so like unlucky with Woodsy like going out because we had big ambitions here mm. for the GC. So then when he was gone, we kind of just stuck. But um, yeah, we, we're keeping the morale up. Mm. We shoot some YouTube videos, have a bit of a laugh, you know. But uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty uh, dismal in the first week when we lost two guys. So then it wasn't looking promising. How does it feel for you to be back at your first Grand Tour since your crash last year in Ruta del Sol, a long recovery period? You also were right heartbreaking there before the Tour de France. You had a positive COVID test. Now suddenly you're back in a Grand Tour, back in the circus. You know, does it feel like, what does it feel like? Because there's nothing that can replace a Grand Tour sort of feeling. What's it like being back, you know? Are you happy to be back? I'm happy to be back, but I'm I'm also happy to sit, like kind of think that if this was my last Grand Tour, I, I also wouldn't be too upset. Yeah, right. <laughs> like it's, it's a, you, you know you, you get used to suffering like week week uh, stage races, but when it's a three week stage race, it's so much different. Fortunately, I'm going okay. So, but uh, yeah, it's been a this has been one of the this has been one of the harder ones for me actually. Just I think as well coming back from injury and also like mentally like. The downhills, they're riding so fast. You know, it's South Espana, slippery roads, guys are hitting the deck. I crashed in the first, uh, first, second stage of the tour. So I've been a bit sketchy myself. You know, my shoulder hasn't been great. So I've been a little bit like anxious and a little bit like kind of letting the wheel go in the corners. And yeah, it's been quite difficult in that way. Why do you think the Peloton's like, you know, even just you explaining that to me, and I'm trying to think back to last year when I was racing and I have always I've alluded to this the last few years things are getting faster ever since that COVID period and you think that's even gone more intense this especially this for Welter why is do you think it's all bubbling up to the surface now everyone's so desperate everyone's racing for every inch so this points this whole points debate is coming now and guys are racing for top 60 on GC now you know just to get those extra points um, stage wins are only top 5 positions but it's 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 the hunger from the teams that are like in the relegation zone that are just pushing on pushing on and there's pressure from the teams there's pressure from the sponsors and then also we've got the other thing is the equipment's faster everything is faster these days and the towns are becoming more busy there's more roundabouts so the peloton is more nervous and the radios and watch out for the roundabout watch out for the roundabout next corner is the roundabout i mean if you heard what goes on our radio every in in holland it was literally non-stop talk for like five hours what's the vibe like between the you know your other guys that you in the race is there still that nice feeling in the bunch you know the Vuelta typically for me there was a bit of a relaxed feeling those uphill finishes generally were some flat days and then you had an uphill finish that's like glorious for a non-climber because you just got to get to the base of that mountain but is there any sort of relaxed feeling out there or every day it's on like donkey kong no every day is pretty much on yeah it's a you know the the, everyone wants to get something out of this race, uh, especially when you got like Remco is so strong mm. and you know Jumbo Visma is so strong. So, you know, when it spells a breakaway day, normally it's like, oh yeah, someone will try and control it. But now, even if it's a sprint day, guys are like, if we make it super hard and we get a group of thirty, who's going to control it? It's just, uh, it's just nuts. Like the other day, we just saw all the sprinters teams like just come together, like eighteen 
riders near the front and go, we're going to ride for it today. So it kind of put a lot of guys off. But, like, you know, when there's a hill involved or there's an option like a hard start, then it's just on. It's just everyone's just fighting for everything because they can't block the road then. Tell me about stage five when you were second behind Soler. Um, a really good finish, so close, um, but there was not really that much communication between the break. He just hovered just in front of you guys. What was that like coming so close to a stage win at the Vuelta? Even just to come second, I was chuffed already because I I got dropped just before that and I clawed my way back. I caught them at 5k to go and I was like, Pro. I'm, I was hoping for a miracle. I had one more bullet left and I thought, well, I'm going to risk it all for the finish. So I just tagged Fred Wright and went, he's got the most to gain. He's got he's got the legs here. So just tagged on to him. But uh, yeah, it was a shame. You know, I was, I was uh, really hoping that we'd come closer. But yeah, as we came through that roundabout and as Fred kind of like stepped off the gas through the roundabout, I thought, ah, oh, that's it. It's gone. Because we needed to keep going to get around it to Lair. But then the gap opened again and that was, she was done. But I was chuffed, man. Like, from where I came from, from last year and everything, it was kind of like a win for me, mm. but it was, uh, you know, also coming close, it's difficult to like, ah, what could have been? What's the feeling like in the Vuelta? Because the thing I always loved about the Vuelta is it is at the end of the season and there's this sort of feeling like, you know what, all i got to do is just get through this race and the season's done. Opposed to the Giro, opposed to the Tour de France, you've still got a whole season afterwards. Are you getting that sort of feeling in the Vuelta this year that amongst the rest of the guys in that sort of chat when they're in the group, Edo, boys, we've got one week left, one week left of the season, you know, okay, I know there's a few races left, but there's not a whole lot more racing to do after the Vuelta. I mean, in our team, we're doing every single race that's left on the calendar, so we don't have a don't have a break. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the, you can tell the teams that have got the luxury of like having the points in their favour. They're like, okay, this is my last race. I'm shutting my season down after the world. Um, you know, I'm like, oh, there's no way I could go to Lombardia, and I'm thinking, geez, I have to go like a week and a half still after Lombardia. You know, so it's <laughs> like it, it, this has been my longest season ever. You know, I didn't have a break in the off season, so like, yeah, man, I'm just. Uh, I'm looking forward to the end of the season in mid-October. What are you thinking then? What do you, you know, are you still going to click on for a few more years, Daryl? Like, has this been um, a nice little get the engine going after your big break last year? Coming back, you're like, oh, this is actually great. I'm here at the Vuelta. So this has inspired me to go a few more years up until 40. Like, you know, at Valverde. Mate, after riding this race, I feel like giving my contract back. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, no. Well, I'm signing up for another year, so we'll see. But uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, at the, I think next year will be my last day. Yeah. Okay. Oh, beautiful. Well, Daryl, we've got a week ahead coming, and what do you think is going to happen here? It's the the GC shaking up there. You know, it looks like arguably the harder stages are done. What are you looking forward to in the week coming? You look at the stage and you go, like, it could be the hard ones done, but like. Man, the, when, the, when teams like Jumbo and In Your Smell Blood and they sense that red jerseys maybe not unachievable anymore, I think uh, we're going to see a different race this last week. Um, Rimco's team's done well up until now. They've only had six riders, but, uh, you know, it's like that thing you show your form in the first week and you feel so good, you feel so good. And even the other day, following a lot of attacks and things like that, and it just takes, you know, mm. energy out of the energy out of the body. And uh, you know, guys like Roglic and that that experience riding these grand tours, they're just waiting, waiting, waiting. And then we saw, hey, they used their moment. So um, I can still see if it's going to be another hectic day where there's a hectic start and mm. stuff's going out of control. I can see Jumbo doing exactly what they've done now, put pressure on on quick step, and uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for Remco, I think, and very challenging for like a youngster. Like you don't forget, he's young. You know, um, it's going to be quite demanding on him. I think he would have not had a too good night's sleep the last uh, two nights, even though his form's good. But, you know, just having those guys like Roglic yeah. and that chipping away at you won't be easy to sleep at night. So have you- even even talking to Froomey, he was like saying like, oh, man, they smell blood now. If I was them, I'd be going all in <laughs> these next few days. Like, just do it, you know? So... Have you have you picked out anything for yourself in the last week? Anything that's sort of inspiring you to you know focus on? Because it's always good to have that goal as well. If you're just trying to finish the race, sometimes it can just feel too long away. What's your personal ambitions? Um, I think uh, the day after the race day is actually pretty good. It's a little bit of an uphill finish, not like quite hard. I think it's quite hard all day. It's it should be a sprint, but like you know, they've got Mads Peterson here in great form. Mm, so, unbelievable um, for form for short. For sure, Trek's going to like ride for it or if he gets in the brakes. It's like kind of that battle we did with Sagan many years ago. It was like either tag him or he's that good, you know. Either he's going to be in the brake or he's going to go for the win. So, um, 
yeah, we'll just have to see how it plays out. But yeah, definitely a little bit better uphill finish. The other day I thought uphill finish mm. right off my alley. <laughs> I ran out of talent. So, uh, yeah, I didn't uh, – <laughs> I was there but not there. I love when you say something like that because then it just puts it in perspective for me how hard that literally was. You know, if you're running out of legs, who knows where I would have been back in the day. Um, <laughs> tell me, what, what do you got looking – what do you got look to – what have you got to look forward to today? We're on the morning of the rest day. It's been a massive transfer. I was speaking to you last night, 12 o'clock. It's just 8 o'clock in the morning now, so you haven't had much sleep. Anything to look forward to today? Man, just resting. You know what I'm going to – I'm looking forward to actually having an Arvo nap mm-hmm. because, like, yeah, I didn't sleep enough last night, but, like, you know, at the Grand Tour, you get that afternoon nap, like ride, coffee shop, nice feed, and then you just, like – you know, this one, he's like, what time do you want a massage? You're like – He's like six, okay? Yeah. Because you've got like four hours to play with, you know? So I'm looking forward to just having like four hours just to like shut my eyes, just chill out, I don't know, watch some TV or whatever I want to do. But yeah, just, and also I not have anyone bug me or try and push me in the bench or just, ah, just freedom. <laughs> well, Daryl, I'll let you do that, mate. Beautiful. Thanks, bitch. Well, here he is, everyone, the crowd favourite, Durbo. Mate, welcome back to the podcast. I've missed you. Good to see your face. Just trying to wake up from the rest day, so uh, pretty buckled, but good to be back on the pod, and um, yeah, just uh, nice to nice to catch up. Two weeks down in the Vuelta, my favourite race, one of my favourites. I've, I've gone out on a limb and said that second after Paris-Roubaix was the Vuelta Espana. I love that race. Love, hate. As always, you got to love hate races that you love. Um, but mate, before we get going, I want you to just give me one short sentence to describe your feelings, sensations, or emotions where you're at in this year's Vuelta. Quick summary: um, uh, I'm going okay. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, been able to do my job. Look after Caden Groves. Obviously, my my plan was to look after Simon Yates, but Simon Yates went home with COVID. So yeah, I'm getting through. Um, I'm looking forward to this next week. I'm not on my complete knees. So, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to maybe trying to get in a break and look after Kate in the third week. One sentence, I said. That was about 14 sentences. How do I, brother? One oh. sentence. All we have to say is one sentence to describe your feelings or emotions of this year's oh, photo. It's two and out under for three weeks. Give me one short sentence to describe the Peloton's feelings and emotions. So, yours might be something, but what's the feeling of the Peloton? Everyone's buckled. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Let's that everyone's about, tired. Yeah. Everyone is everyone is really tired. Tell me, you've ridden eleven grand, uh, thirteen grand tours. You're in your eleventh year pro. You know what's going on. Thirty one years old. You've been a pro. You know how it goes. But actually, your first time in the Vuelta after all these years, you've ridden eight Tour de France's, four Giro's, one Vuelta. Can you put it in perspective to these other grand tours and help everyone explain, understand more? Sorry. The Tour de France, everyone thinks they know that because we know the most about that on TV. Then I feel second is the Giro, the most beautiful race of the year. We sort of get a bit of a vibe about that. The Vuelta slips under the cards. And something I've been trying to preach out there to a lot of people, maybe even you over the years or other riders, mate, this is hard. This is just damn hard race. No one really realizes it. What is the difference between all the Grand Tours? Can you explain it? I mean, I always gave the Vuelta a lot of respect. That's why I didn't want to do it. Um, mm. <laughs> it. It looked on TV from what I saw and listening to yourself and other people, it, it's, it looked just so hot and so hard. And it was like everyone who had missed their bullets in the Giro or missed their bullets in the Vuelta, uh, in the Tour, went to the Vuelta. So you got just as strong a field, if not stronger field, with guys that maybe crashed in the Tour de France or got sick in the Giro, and they come out swinging with the last chance saloon in the Vuelta to do something in the Grand Tour. Mm. And whenever you notice that with COVID, whenever you put the mentality of like, this is the last chance to do something, the level's so Mm. high, the desperation is so high. And you can see that already because there's 140 guys left in the Peloton, which means I'm busy with COVID rocking the Peloton, but the level is just so high. If you're not at 90% at least, you, you 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 can't even get through the race. So for me, I... I gave it a lot of respect. I was nervous coming in because I'm not necessarily that good in the heat. But, yeah, it's, it's brutal. It's brutal. Like the what, what makes it brutal? Like I know I can think about the things for me. 
what is it? Because everyone just envisions, envisions, and I've also painted this picture too. Yeah, it's super relaxed, the Vuelta. It is relaxed outside the race, but once you kick off in the race, it's pretty tough racing, isn't it? It's because what, what is it for you this year that you've noticed in comparison to other races that's made it so tough? Well, one, it's the way it's been raced. Two, the the weather. Like, it, it's sort of been sitting at a constant 30, but you know the road temp is hotter than that. And we've done a lot down south. Um, once we left, and even then it was still hot and humid in the north. So we, we haven't really, I mean, we haven't really left 30 degrees for two weeks now, over 30 degrees. And that just sort of wears your body down. Um, I would say out of all the three Grand Tours, it's the less stressful because a lot of the times – the roads in Spain are fantastic. There's a lot less road furniture than any other country than France and then in Italy. And the road quality is a lot better. So the stress overall, I'd say, is less in terms of... But what that does mean is it means that some guys might struggle positioning-wise to get to the front and be able to attack, where now is just no option. If you, you can mm. get to the front, it's a lot easier. Um, if you've got an engine, you can get to the front and you can do, you can do damage. Um, Suits the Jay Vines of the world. Well, yeah, just because I'm not just saying Jay doesn't have skills, but I'm just saying he's new to this whole pro world. So guys like that who've just got huge The Rogaliches engines. of the world. <laughs> you, you want me to throw someone on the bus? I can. I can pick someone. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Luke Durbridge yeah, of the, the world. The Luke Durbridge of the world who just can't ride positioning. Um, small circles. Anyway, <laughs> the uh, so that's what I'd say. And then So the heat... And also the, the 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 climbs here are, I think the the outer, uh, the the steepness of the climbs in the welter um, for mm. a big guy is is something that I'm been noticing that has been really suffering. Like in the tour, we we have big Alps, you know, five six percent. Um, that sort of really seems to I can get over one or two of those first and then do my job into the last one. But here, when you're talking eight ten sometimes 15% climbs, it's just so goddamn steep here. And, that was, and mm. as you, you would know, Mitch, these roads that go up to places that, why would you even have a road up here and it's beautiful hot mix? But, uh, yeah, so that's what something I've probably been surprised about, how steep they are. I remember before compacts were a thing, well, before we had um, front chain rings that were small enough to hold um, very small inner chain rings, we used to have to put a compact chain ring on which was, you know, essentially a, a mountain bike chain ring sort of. I remember it was probably eight or nine stages in the Vuelta I would have the compact on, just purely because you're going over a climb that would tap out 15% plus. And you're just thinking, regardless if I'm racing or over that, if I'm just trying to ride over that climb, <laughs> yeah, I need I to have it. a small gear. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And there's the, even the Giro, as, as tough as those climbs are, I remember only putting a comeback on maybe three or four times in the in the Giro. The Vuelta consistently has, you know, steep pinches in it, doesn't it? All day. It's been bloody hard. And I think that uh, it, is a, it is a really nice race. That's one I've definitely enjoyed to do. It's never been perfect for my season in terms of where I do my races. So it hasn't ever, never fallen into place. But I'm glad that I'm here and I can do a Vuelta like, it would be nice to do all three Grand Tours and, and I'm here and we, we, we've had some great success with Caden. So, yeah, it's been a nice time. We've only got five guys too now, so it's a bit of a small squad. Mm. But, no, it's been, it's been nice. How does it feel racing in Spain, you know, like essentially home? Like you spend a lot of time in Andorra. Sometimes you're down in Girona as well. So, like you, you've got that sort of feeling around Spain. What's it feel like to be racing at home? Sort of, you, I know you're not racing around those roads, but you, there is this feeling... Ah, I'm, I could just get home at any second if I need to. And, you know, you, you speak in the language, the same sort of mentality that you used to. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Because we don't really, well, you and I sort of race the same program. We don't really race in Spain at all. I never did Volta Catalunya or the Basque Country, the other Spanish races, or San Sebastian. So I never had that feeling except for in the Volta España. It's sort of nice, isn't it, being racing around Spain? I haven't gone and ventured out and looked about looked around Spain much either. You know, it's actually just nice to see some new places and, like, I didn't – I sort of knew south of Spain was quite, like, outback Australia. You know what I mean? It's got mm. that sort of Barossa Valley feel about it, doesn't it? It's, like, really, you know, dry, the vineyards or the olive trees and things like that. 
And um, it's actually just been really nice to just see all these different random places in Spain. And, um, yeah, I, I've enjoyed it to be, like you said, it sort of feels a bit more familiar than other races. Mm. You know, that sort of feeling of like, okay, even just the way you go down the hills and on the roads and like the, the, the tarmac, you know, every it's crazy to think just over the border the tarmac changes, you know, and the road furniture changes and the flow of the roads change. But now you're in Spain, you're like, well, it's just like back home, you know. Tell me about what's going on in the peloton at the moment and there's this relegation system. I was speaking with Daryl about this as well. You know, this has added an extra element of stress to the peloton where, you know, teams are even assessing which teams they need to follow. It's just another element to the last race of the year, apart from, like you said, guys searching for contracts. That used to be a thing that you'd feel in the peloton. Then there were guys who just want to get that one more result because they've missed out in the Tour or the Giro or whatever. Now we're adding this new relegation system in. What's that done to the stress of the peloton and this ever-increasing speed of the bunch that we're talking about all the time? I feel like it's gone now to a new level, Super Saiyan level. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it is super Saiyan level at the moment. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I haven't quite turned yet. I'm still mortal at the moment, just on the on the bus. <laughs> um, yeah, it, look, I hate it to be honest, Mitch. Um, I think you can <laughs> like every team in the bottom five would say the same. I'm sure um, the stress is is, is is horrible for sponsors, for managers, for directors, for riders. Um, it's just not a nice place to be in. And I think it's, it's unfair. It's so unfair mm. in a pandemic to be able to do this to, to teams. Cause you know, everyone's had Israel from us to Lotto to like, everyone's been f-ed up with, with, um, with COVID. And, you know, we, we were banking on getting some really nice points for Simon Yates and he was going really well. And we were, I reckon we were going to be battling for maybe that podium and that would have been, put us out of relegation battle and we've been fine. But then, you know, he goes home with COVID. So, and then for a welter stage when you get a hundred points and um, for a one day race in Maryland, you get 300 or some shit. So it's, it's mm. just a bit out of proportional and I'm not disrespecting any results at all, but it's just, it's, it's not a nice position for everyone to be in. So yeah, I'm hoping that they see some common sense in it, the UCI, but, so not so above my pay grade, and uh, I just got to. We just got to play the game at this moment. What was that like when Simon Yates? Ironically, when Simon Yates stopped the race the same day, Caden Groves, young sprinter, Australian sprinter from your team, he stepped up, got a stage win, first stage win in a Grand Tour. Like, how's the mixed emotions there? What were you guys thinking on the bus? Oh, there we go. You know, oh, there's our chance. Yates is gone. How'd you guys turn that around that day? Oh, it was bad. Like we, Gene came in, the director, Gene Bates, and he said, oh, hey, guys, got a minute? And just sort of, you know, Simon's gone positive for COVID. Had a fever last night. And we were just like, oh, you know, just felt for the guy. You know, it was 10 days of really solid work by the team. He was starting to, had a really good time trial on a dead flat course. Mm. You know, we were really getting excited, you know. So on the bus, it was a bit down, I guess. You know, everyone was a bit sort of, Somba, but then you know we got some tunes going on, and you know Lucas put some tunes on, and we started to get a bit motivated. And then you know we sort of said Gene came in and just literally said like, "All right, boys, like I know this has happened, but we've got a job to do today, and we really can do it. So let's let's get into it." And we all got like pretty g'd up about it, and uh, everyone out there went and, and, and nailed their role. It was a really sort of hard block headwind sort of day. And, yeah, the boys delivered in the final, like, exceptional. And um, and we won it. It was just – it was really special. And that's probably why I really love this team as well because the mentality for us to bounce back like that was mm. was really special. And um, it was one of my really fond memories, actually, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of that. Can you relate – when we talk about this, and I know what you're talking about, we talk about, oh, it's so hard, this this race this year, it's, it's been so hard, it's been so fast. How do we relate that to the people listening out there? Because unless you've ridden a Grand Tour, unless you know when you're in this second rest day fatigued, two weeks fatigued, the bunch goes fast, what can you relate it to? I know there's a ride back in WA that you ride that a lot of people might know, the Puppers World Championship. Can you relate it somewhat to that? That's one, and this is ten. You know, how can we give some perspective to what you're doing to just the every Joe Blow out there listening? How, how can we actually relate this to something? What's it like? 
the first two hours of the race is the puppers ride complete. And then mm. you rest. So that's – Yeah. So once you're completely yeah. finished, you've done Boxing Day World Championship puppers if you're from Perth. And uh, so you do two hours absolutely full gas. And you roll in. 50K at, an hour, 50K full K gas. 50K an hour, two hours, finished with the sprint. Everyone's completely blown. Everyone's looking around each other like, oh, how was that? And, you know, like – and then everyone rolls off and gets a coffee together and has a rest. We just sort of like settle in there to some zone three, zone two maybe for another two hours, post that, and then ramp it up again for another two hours of poppers again. <laughs> another <at the> poppers. <laughs> Day one. Back to back poppers. You know, it's like but back to back with a bit of just sort of like, you know, just a bit of tempo in between just to keep the engine running, you know. Um, but, yeah, that's sort okay, of so what I'm saying. <laughs> if anyone's listening out there, the hardest bunch ride you've done for two hours – just do some tempo in between, <laughs> hardest bunch ride to finish off, get ready for the next day. <laughs> it's ridiculous to think about that. And you, everyone listening might think we're, we're over-exaggerating, but it is literally that, isn't it? You get trained for it, don't you? I think I was – because my roommate, unfortunately, Kelly O'Brien, went home. Um, but uh, it was his first grandie and, and I was just talking to him about it and he was, uh, he was just saying, you know, like he's just like, yeah, right. Like you, there's nothing that can prepare you for this. Like you can't train this hard. You can't go out and replicate it. Like until you're here and doing it, you, it's you just can't replicate that sort of fatigue and that sort of like I am so tired, but I have to just keep going. You know, like mm. I don't know how but somehow you, you you end up just using all your lower back and your your arms and everything like that to pedal the bike, not your legs, because they're so. F- it's just amazing to realise that people are still not getting dropped behind you or you're following a wheel and you're thinking to yourself, someone is actually on the front of this bunch right now <laughs> pushing wind. I'm sitting in the wheel. Who could possibly be riding on the front of this bunch right now? I mean, sometimes he thinks it's it's Jesus or something, you know, like it's supernatural. <laughs> you're just like, who the hell is setting the pace? How is this possible? I'm doing 70, you know, but... It's surprisingly the yo-yo effect is so big, you know. Like I've ridden the front some days here at the Vuelta, and guys have come up and gone, "Oh, mate, big old day on the tools, eh? We was hurting on the wheel." And like because you don't get the surges on the front, and because you don't, you get like occasional run on the back of the motorbike, and you can set the pace yourself and all that sort of things, like. You know, like if someone was just to randomly come up and just cork you in the leg, you're not ready for it, you know? Mm. You punch yourself in the leg, you know it's coming. So it's uh, a okay. <laughs> like, great analogy. <laughs> so, that's why it's so <laughs> But Lastly, Derbs, it's rest day now. You're in bed. You've just woken up. You're just sort of trying to piece things together. What have you got planned? What's something you can look forward to today on a rest day and psych yourself up for this last week? The last race of the year, you can actually start smelling it now. The end of the season's coming, isn't it? Um, we had a few nice alumbras last night because uh, we finished in Granada, so we picked up some of them and had a had a nice beer. And oh, this might be the highlight of my day talking to you, Mitchy. So uh, that mm-hmm. that'll be good. Good to catch up, and uh, I was doing an hour easy and get someone to rub my body, and then um, yeah, that'll be good. Perfect, mate. Well, I'll leave you to it, and. Uh, Good luck in this last week, mate. I'll see you when you come out to Australia for the World Championships. Thanks, mate. All right, here we are. I'm talking with Fred Wright, Bahrain Victorious, 23-year-old. He's from the UK. Fred, mate, you've just been on fire the second half of this year. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, hi, mate. Yeah, it's... I just, I'm just enjoying the life, you know. Second Grand Tour of the year, and just on the road with, on the road with the team, and yeah, loving, loving life. <laughs> right, yeah. it, was, it was ridiculous. Like you've been so close so many times. Like the Tour de France, you were second in the stage 13. The Com Games, you were second in the individual time trial. You're up there in the road race as well, looking really strong. I tipped you for the road race win just because of the way you're riding at the Tour de France. Three times in the top 10 at the Tour, and now five times in the top 10 at this years for welter mate you've just been just keep going but just haven't been able to really capitalize on that what's the feeling so far about your form and um you know that infamous win so the tour kind of didn't feel like you know i felt like it was it was good that i was i was so close but not you know i wasn't so like upset that 
maybe I didn't didn't quite finish it off because I was you know there wasn't much I could have done in those in those in those situations I was just sort of you know I didn't feel like I'd, I'd made a mistake whereas the stage seven or whatever it was where I uh, mm. yeah I just went a bit early the sprint that was that was probably, that was a bit of a hard hit I must say I, Hereda I did, came around you he's surprisingly not known for his sprinting legs and you just started yeah, leading I, her out. I did, yeah, I did sort of think, yeah, okay, that one. That's the first time <laughs> in my career where I was like, yeah, I I may have thrown that that opportunity away, but no, nah, it's I'm I'm really pleased with how I'm going. I think it helped actually that basically before the tour, I was meant to do Tour de Swiss, and I ended up getting COVID, and I think mm. I just basically obviously had to have time off with that, and I think the lack of racing in that period has kind of meant it was. So I went to the tour maybe a little bit undercooked and then came out of it in, in good nick and now I'm sort of here in the same similar shape. So in the end, well, that, can you, you know, at the time I was like, yeah. oh God, I've got COVID at the worst possible time. This is <laughs> terrible. But I think it actually sort of made the season, it's almost made the season more manageable. You know, I've sort of had, yeah, it was a week off of just doing nothing at home. At a, what seemed like a crucial point in the season, but actually was, I think it's quite good to have. Could you ever no. imagine doing that to yourself, going, you know what, I might just have a week off um, leading into the tour and um, yeah. <laughs> you, you would just never do it, would you? No, you would, you'd never do it. But I think that's sometimes sort of a good lesson for the for the future, you know. You don't always have to do, you know, sometimes you just got to let it, I don't know. I, th- I think sometimes, sometimes we train ourselves and ride our bikes mm. to a point of fatigue that's just a little bit ridiculous. And I think after this world, I'm definitely going to be at that, at that point of fatigue <laughs> can you can you give anyone listening an idea of what it actually is like to do this load that you've had the tour de france is a beast in itself then you just got the commonwealth games and whoever want anyone who's not in the commonwealth listening they're they're a pretty big deal for the commonwealth and you go to the commonwealth games pretty much off the back of the tour and next thing you know the vuelta is actually starting how did you get your head around it mentally physically you sort of explained how that's happened but psychologically that's a massive part of riding ground tours two grand tours more or less back to back with the com games stuck in between I, I guess i've kind of from the tour it was like okay commie games is next let's see and immediately in that time trial i was like okay i've i've got really good legs off this tour like i was that was you know the best time trial i've ever done so i was like okay wow this is this is great and it was almost like you know i was getting sort of messages from sports directors on the team like yeah fred see you at the welter like <laughs> that was that was my place confirmed you know that was that was it but with the welter i kind of almost the mindset was more that i was you know i could see that there were going to be lots of opportunities and i knew i was going well and i was kind of just to be honest, i was looking just looking forward to having the three weeks on the road i'm not mm-hmm. you know the moment i've you know i've got my girlfriend but i've got not that many ties uh, you got nothing home. else going on. Uh, you know, yeah, it's right. like a, a, bit of a, a bit of a holiday, uh, almost, yeah. almost, sort of. <laughs> well, can, can you give me a sentence that would describe your sort of feelings or sensations or your emotions? A bit of a quick sentence from this year's Vuelta. I'd, I'd just say less stressful than the tour. I think that's the mm. <laughs> that's the nice. the one thing that's kind of made everything easier is that it's, every day is nowhere near as bad as some of the the worst, the hardest or whatever days we had at the tour. So I think that's kind of what's been getting me through. It's like, oh, we're just, oh, this isn't going to be as bad as the outdoor stage or for the harder days. And then for even for the sprint days, you know, there's no, the bunch is it's so different. It's so like, a, it's like a, almost like a different race. You just kind of, there's so many big, well, it, wide Spanish roads and you just sort of, you know, once the brakes yeah. gone, it's like, it's a different story. Well, it's, it's very interesting hearing your perception on this. Someone who's got crystals in their legs crystals in their cranks because i've been speaking to luke durbridge and daryl Olympia as well and they have a very very different opinion of the race they've been of the opinion this is much harder than the tour you know the stress is much less but the racing's been ferociously hard what do you think about the actual racing i guess because i've i've had the what the tour was this year in, in my legs i think it's it's like the, the the other day i was up there in the bunch kick on the sort of the, the day that Mads won stage 13 apart from the last 10k it was just like it just felt it just felt like a bit of a just a training <laughs> ride almost you know not, <laughs> not to be you're just not fighting for every little corner or I think just because you're always on quite often you're on these just big big wide smooth roads mm. so how have you been nice. how have you been handling the weather you know do you have any techniques that you've been doing yourself to handle the heat 
I've been I've been telling as many people as I can that I'm sort of friends with in the bunch, but but if you just get some uh, ice cubes and put them under your armpits, I swear that's that's been <laughs> doing the business for me. Ice cubes on the armpits. How do you how do you slip them in there during the stage? <laughs> well, you know we get ice socks. So I normally like yeah. I take one ice sock for the neck and then rip apart another one and put put ice cubes on each on each under each armpit. <laughs> and that's that does that really that, I, I think it's something it must be I don't know it's just yeah that cools me down the most I think yeah nice so how did you pick up that little technique it was really hot in to- I think one of the Slovenians was telling me about what Roglic did before the time trial at the tour no not the tour the, at the Olympics when he won right and how he was like he, he, he basically put ice all over his body just to stay <laughs> to stay cool and one of the places was an armpit it was his armpit so I was like oh I'm gonna do that how is the rest of the bunch been handling the heat? Like, what's the general feel within the bunch at the Vuelta? Because as you said, it is can be quite relaxed, the atmosphere around the bunch. There's not a lot of stress, but has because of now there's that relegation, have you noticed that, you know, some of the teams are fighting a little bit unnecessarily more than you would expect for position or people getting a bit frustrated with the heat? I think we sort of felt that a bit the other day with the the breakaway like you know it's so hot and if you fight for so long for the breakaway at some point it was like 80k two days ago mm. to the fight and in the end no no one actually really wanted to be there anymore because everyone was just yeah. completely cooked <laughs> so yeah i think it's that it's 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 a weird it's a weird time at the moment actually with the with the whole points thing i'm quite glad that i'm not you know we're not having to fight for it because you know you've got like the ef guys are all like there's three of them all pushing for the gc and that's yeah. difficult, difficult, definitely well, what about you now? Are you targeting anything specific now? Because you've had you've had a third place behind Daryl Limpy and Mark Soler, who in um you know in, back in stage five, stage seven, you were um, third again after a big lead out. Yeah, I, I, he, I, I, I he wanna, came around. I, I wanna that that stage is will forever be in my memory of are oh, you stupid, silly, silly, <laughs> silly. <laughs> Can, can you go? What, what about this last week? You know, you've been in every other thing. You're in the bun sprint the other day. You're doing well in the time trial. What about this last week? Immediately, stage 16, depending on how the other teams want to control, is another similar finish to the one that Pedersen won. So I think that's that's a big target, just straight away off out of the rest day. And then also stage nineteen is like a short day with a couple of clients. It's a good good break, good breakaway day basically. Yeah. And then yeah, I'll see what happens in Madrid as well <laughs> <laughs> are you getting this feeling like because there was always this feeling with the Vuelta for me that there's this sense of like you know what I've just got to get to the end of the Vuelta and the season's over you know of course there's some races afterwards you've got the Worlds and some other little races but essentially the season's done are you getting that feeling now a week out from the end of the race well no I, I'm I'm kind of I've not got many races you know I'm getting to the end of this week then it's the world champs again mm. off to Australia I've never been there before it's almost like another whole exciting trip you know it's not mm. like oh wow I'm going to Australia you know like that's almost not and then once I've done that it's it's, in, it's it goes quick man it's quite scary it doesn't feel like it was that the end of the last season that that long ago I think sometimes it goes slower but I, spe- I think this season's really really flown by and I'm I can't wait for off season to be honest it's going to yeah, be lovely. It does, it does build up, doesn't it? And you get to these grand tours. That's why also why I did love doing the Vuelta because it is a nice little crescendo to the end of the season. It was my favourite grand tour of, for sure. How are you sitting now? You've done four grand tours. Where does the Vuelta sit in your oh, heart this, now? You've, this one's been, I think, been my, my most favourite I've done so far. Wow. I, Big call. I, I, why? Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I don't know. I think just the atmosphere... I've just really, I've just really enjoyed it. I mean, it's. I tell you what, it's been a real shame is that we've lost, we lost Santi and Wout to to COVID. I think if without COVID, I think this would have been definitely top, top, top. But no, nah, it's still been really good. Nah, really have you good. enjoyed? Have you enjoyed the crowd, the especially the Basque up in the Basque country, all the oh, people that was, on the side of the roads? They, that was that was something else. No, that really was. It's not far off sort of tour crowds, and yeah, the the race, the sort of general racing is just a bit more chill. So it's. It's lovely. <laughs> what, what, what about the, the gnarly sort of steep roads that they keep just sort of surprising you with and finding and these goat tracks and these sort of things? Because that's different to the tour. That's different to any grand tour. And you don't see that really in the Giro either. They find these crazy-ass steep roads. That's where my Vuelta then goes completely the opposite and goes completely downhill. As soon as we start hitting these, like... <laughs> I, like, yesterday, I was, I was in the break and I was just trying to hang on on the first stupidly sort of steep climb and I was just like what this is 
just awful. awful. <laughs> I mean, that, <laughs> but, but then you know, like even the Sierra Nevada climb was yesterday started like 4k at 10 percent or whatever, and it was just the worst thing ever. But then as soon as we hit the five percent gradients, it was like it was, and you start getting up to you, you know, carry a bit more speed. It was so much better. But yeah, you've 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 you pointed out the worst part, <laughs> but I can get to the worst part. Then there's not been that many stupid goat tracks. <laughs> well, mate, we're on the we're on the final rest day, the last week in front. What do you got to look forward to today? What do you like doing on a rest day? They seem to go by annoyingly fast. Like we'll go out for for a ride in in, in a little bit, and then you come back, you sort of lie on your bed. I've got. I'll probably stick an episode of a series on or, or something and then and then it's massaged and the, you know it's, it just they just disappear it's always you always mm. want another two hours I think I'm always I always look at my phone and it's five o'clock and I'm like where is that oh, day no. gone but it's nice no, it's like the last day of school holidays isn't it you get to that last day and you think oh no it's all over <laughs> yeah no exactly you get to sort of seven o'clock and you're off to dinner again and you're like oh here we go this now it begins again <laughs> well Fred we're going to be watching you this week mate I can't wait to see you get that infamous stage win I know you're on the cusp of it it's going to be great to see I hope so we'll, we'll see we'll see <laughs> Well, what did you think of that one? Did you get a bit more of an insight to it? Now you're watching the Vuelta of Spain, you're going to see those guys in the race right now. You're going to hear their voice. You're going to hear that tension in them. How's it different from Fred Wright compared to the rest? He's cruising through this race, arguably not even struggling at all, finding it pretty relaxed, pretty easy. Such a different feeling to Darren Olympi, Luke Durridge, and of course, Luke Platt, who's just in his first Grand Tour, but I think actually... For his first Grand Tour, he's cruising through. He wouldn't know it yet, but I don't think he has anything to worry about getting to Madrid at the end of this week. I love talking to them. It's great to be back talking about the World Tour as well. We've had some different episodes the last few weeks. We're on the road with me last week, and now we're back talking road cycling. That is my passion at the end of the day, and I love talking to these guys, talking about the Peloton, where I used to be, where I've spent a lot of my life. Like I said at the start of this episode, Life in the Peloton is being brought to you by our partner, Rafa, this year. And as you know already, I'm ecstatic to have them on board. I'm loving working with them on the podcast, but also outside here in Australia. We're doing great adventures. The World Championship's coming up. There's some exciting stuff brewing. I'm going to talk about that in the coming podcasts coming up. Will Jones, who's pieced this episode together and pieces the episodes together each week for you, and Lara behind the scenes, who helps me put together the podcast for you guys each week. Guys, thanks for listening. And next week, I've got a special talking look for you featuring the four guys we spoke to this week. It's the Vuelta Edition Talking Luft. Yes, I've managed to able to squeeze together some new questions for Talking Luft for next week. So guys, sit back and enjoy the rest of the Vuelta España, and I'll speak to you next week. The music in this episode was composed by Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.